The 210th meeting of the National Council on the Arts is now in session. Good morning. I'm Maria Rosario Jackson, Chair of the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm a woman with curly dark hair and glasses. I'm wearing a black long sleeve dress and I have a silver necklace. Welcome members of the National Council on the Arts, NEA staff, regional, state, and local arts leaders, and members of the public. Welcome to the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts in the great city of New Orleans, Louisiana. We're gathered today in Bulbacom, the Choctaw name for New Orleans meaning land of many tongues. These are the ancestral and unceded lands of the Caddo, Chitimacha, Choctaw, Homa, Ishak, Natchez, and Tunica peoples and the Petite Nations. We also recognize the Alabama, Biloxi, Kozati, and Ofo peoples and others who were pushed into Louisiana from their ancestral lands. We honor these communities past, present, and future. Thank you to our hosts at the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts for providing this beautiful space for our meeting. For the record, our National Council on the Arts members joining us today, here in person and virtually, are Ishmael Ahmed of Michigan, Gretchen Gonzalez Davidson of Michigan, Emil Kang of New York, Fiona Whelan Prine of Tennessee, and Jake Shimabukuro of Hawaii, Connie Williams of Pennsylvania, Bruce Carter of Florida, Aaron Dworkin of Michigan, Keenan Azme of New York, Waskar Medina of Kansas, Camila Forbes of New York, Maria De Leon of Texas, Rani Ramaswamy of Minnesota, Bita Becker of Arizona and the Navajo Nation, and Christopher Morgan of Hawaii are participating virtually. Absent are Deepa Gupta, Paul Holtz, and Michael Lombardo. And now please welcome Susanna Johnson, Executive Director of the Louisiana Division of the Arts, to say a few words. Good morning. I'm Susanna Johansson. I am a white woman with red curly hair wearing a bright pink uh, blazer. Thank you, Chair Jackson, National Council Board members, and NEA staff for having the foresight to come to New Orleans in June. The tourists have fled, so we saved some heat and humidity just for you. All kidding aside, on behalf of everyone in Louisiana, bienvenue, welcome. We are thrilled that you are here. Your presence here highlights the importance arts and culture have on our everyday lives. Yesterday, you saw a small snippet of what Louisiana has to offer in the way of amazing artists, students, and deep-rooted culture that is only found in Louisiana. This small sample can be expanded exponentially around the state and includes our French cultures found in the Acadiana area, our bayou cultures found in the really deep southern portions of Louisiana, and our northern portion of the state with its rich Delta Blues traditions. We hope that in addition to a few extra pounds, you take back home with you the understanding that in Louisiana, arts, culture, and heritage is our way of life. It is infused in all that we do and all that we are. Louisiana has a strong creative economy that the Louisiana Division of the Arts our nine regional arts councils and outside organizations, including South Arts and the NASA, work tirelessly to support. Louisiana is a very sticky state. People are born here and tend to stay here. And because of this, our cultures are not diluted. We have a rich history that celebrates our culture through our visual arts, our music and performance arts, and our culinary arts. We greatly appreciate the NEA and the funding that support provides. The budget increase for next year will have a huge impact on our ability to grow and expand our programming. So thank you for all that you do on behalf of the arts. Louisiana welcomes you and is very appreciative of your hard work and dedication to moving the needle forward. We hope that you come back again soon, maybe in the fall, and explore all that Louisiana has to offer. Thank you.
Thank you, Susanna. It is truly a pleasure to be here with you. Everyone, please turn your attention to the screen. We have a video message from Congressman Troy A. Carter, Sr. Good morning, everyone. I'm Congressman Troy Carter, and welcome to the 210th National Council on Arts meeting. I'm honored to welcome you to my hometown, New Orleans. New Orleans is a jewel of art and culture, not just in the United States, but in the world. Art is a part of Louisianans' everyday lives. It's found in the jazz and blues and music floating through our streets. It's found in our ornate costumes and floats during Mardi Gras. Even in our architecture and our street titles tell a story about Louisiana history and culture. This is a special city, one that has served as an inspiration for some of the greatest artists of our time. The National Council of Arts and National Endowment of the Arts serve a vital role in supporting art in our country. From world-renowned creators to local artists, it is crucial that we uplift art and the people who make it. It is especially important to me that all opportunities are accessible and equitable to everyone. The National Endowment of the Arts is making this, rea this a reality for creating and experiencing art throughout the United States. Art is a vital part of our lives that we must uplift. I'm grateful for these organizations and the impact they have on our city, our nation, and our world. Once again, welcome to New Orleans. I hope you will have an inspiring meeting, that you will enjoy all that we have to offer, our food, our craft, the artisans, the crafts, the culture bearers. New Orleans is, in fact, home of culture. And we love it, and we love you. Have a fantastic time. Our thanks to Representative Carter for the kind words about the importance of the arts to our country and the work we do at the National Endowment for the Arts. The NEA, which was established by Congress in 1965 and signed into law by President Lyndon Johnson, is charged with making the arts available to all Americans. We're a funder, a grant maker, and also a national resource, a convener, connector, and a catalyst a catalyst to help bolster arts, design, and culture in all communities. The National Council on the Arts advises on agency policies, programs, and grants. Before I share some updates since our last meeting, I'll say a few words about why we're meeting in New Orleans, Louisiana. Meeting here provides council, some NEA staff, and partners with a unique and rich joint learning opportunity. It's important to be proximate to the work to understand how, um, how we're landing and what we can do to expand our, our mission and serve. Without question, New Orleans and Louisiana have helped to shape American culture in so many ways. New Orleans and Louisiana are home to a wide range of NEA grantees, honorees, and partners. It's a place that's had its share of adversity, and every time, the arts have played an important role in its comeback. New Orleans and the state of Louisiana offer us various ways of how I can't the arts hear anybody. New Orleans and the state of Louisiana offers us various ways of how the arts can help and with well-being, resilience, and healing on physical, mm -hmm. emotional, and economic levels. Having the council meeting here in New Orleans also allows us to better understand the vertical axis of funding in place how we at the federal level collaborate and interact with regional, state, and local arts agencies to reach more communities. Meeting the artists and arts organizations and arts administrators working in here in New Orleans and all over the state, seeing some of the projects that work to preserve culture and help heal community from various forces shows how this place epitomizes the idea of artful lives. Artful Lives is a concept I've been lifting up for the past year and a half as chair of the Arts Endowment. It underscores that belief that the arts are at their most powerful when they're woven into the fabric of community. The arts are not extra. Rather, they're inextricable from our lived experience and what we hold as most valuable. We're grateful to all who welcomed us here, who were generous with their time and wisdom in sharing reflections on their arts practice its role in community, and their thoughts about the future of the arts sector. Thank you. And now, for our first order of business, 
Can I get a motion to approve the minutes of the March 2023 council meeting? Thank you. Second. Thank you. Now, I'd like to introduce Ayana Hudson, Chief Strategy, Programs, and Engagement Officer at the NEA. Ayana. Thank you, Chair Jackson. I'm an African-American, middle-aged female with medium-length dark hair and bangs. I'm wearing a multicolored shirt with a black sweater, glasses, and light brown lipstick. I use she, her pronouns. Now we will proceed with the application review section of the agenda. The tally of the votes will be announced at the end of today's session. The council will be voting today on award recommendations totaling more than $1 million in the national initiatives category. For your vote to be tallied, you must be either present in the room or joining the meeting via video conference at the time of the motion, discussion, and vote. Council members join us by video conference. You must email your votes to Kim Jefferson immediately at the conclusion of this part of the meeting. Council members' affiliations are recorded in the council book and later will be attached to your emailed votes. Each member has been provided an opportunity to update this information prior to the meeting. Council members are recorded as not voting on applications with which they are affiliated. This list becomes part of the agency's official record. May I have a motion to consider the recommendations in the council book? Is there a second? Thank you. I will now summarize the national initiatives category and then ask you to mark your ballots. National initiatives support a wide variety of projects of national and field-wide significance. At this meeting, the council is requested to approve funding for two projects, totally more than $1 million. Support is requested for the Mayor's Institute on City Design, a program that assists mayors with urban design challenges, promotes design excellence and economic revitalization, and enhances the livability of communities across the country. And a national services initiative that will support research, information, and professional development services for the National Endowment for the Arts, state arts agencies, and the six regional arts organizations in cooperation with the agency's state and regional arts education, and folk and traditional arts programs. Council members, you may now mark your ballots. Council members joining virtually, you may now email your votes to Kim Jefferson. Finally, we turn our attention to the projects in the award update section of the council book. These projects have been awarded under the chair's delegated authority and are brought to the council's attention at this meeting, but no vote is necessary. Included in this section are two extraordinary actions and one interagency agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ayana. I'll take the next few minutes to share some updates since our last meeting in March. I'll start with a couple of NEA initiatives, one that finished in May and one that just began. On May 9th and 10th, our National Poetry Recitation Contest, Poetry Out Loud, was held at its national finals at the Listener Auditorium at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Our partners in the state arts agencies held contests during the winter and early spring. More than 158,000 students participated in Poetry Out Loud nationwide this year. State and jurisdictional champions came to Washington to compete for the title of national champion. It was exciting to see these students show off their command of poetic expression and their passion for the topics treated in the poems. But it was also inspiring to see their in interaction with each other, the competition, the camaraderie, deep affection and respect. This program has proven to be an artful and educational experience that allows them to bolster their confidence and master communication skills. Our champion this year is Sri Buddha Chana Munjulari, a high school junior from Indiana. We have a short interview with her about her experience participating in Poetry Out Loud. Thank you. 
My name is Sripadarchana Munjuluri. I'm from Indiana and I go to Columbus North High School. I found Poetry Out Loud last year. I love the fact that students are not just reading a poem or reading words, but they're actually sharing a part of their identity, sharing what's important to them. The poems that I chose share a different facet of what I believe in and who I am. I've come to really love the art form and literary form of poetry. Even though it's just normal, you know, English, you express stuff that's so much deeper through poetry than you can through just prose, I think. I found Poetry Out Loud pretty life-changing. It really puts you in a different community of people who care about art as a tool to make global change. While one major NEA initiative uh, ended for the year, another just started, starting on May 20th, Armed Forces Day, and continuing through the summer until Labor Day, museums throughout the nation are offering free admission to the nation's active duty military personnel and their families, including National Guard and Reserve. For the last 14 years, the NEA has partnered with the Blue Star Families, an organization serving military families, on this initiative in collaboration with the Department of Defense and participating museums. We had a great launch event at the end of May in Dayton, Ohio, at the Dayton Art Institute. Kathy Roth Duque of Blue Star Families and I were joined by Mayor of Dayton, Jeffrey Mims Jr., and Donna Collins with the Ohio Arts Council, as well as many local military families who enjoyed exploring the museum and taking part in art making activities. In addition to Ohio, I've had the chance to visit some other communities over the last few months since our last meeting. For example, in April, I participated in a Kennedy, Cent a Kennedy Library Forum in Boston titled Strengthening Civic Infrastructure and Combating Hate, the Role of the Arts, Culture, and Faith, which featured powerful opening remarks by Second Gentleman Douglas M. Off. Mr. Emhoff talked about not only standing up to hatred, but also about the importance of telling our stories and sharing the joy of our many diverse cultures. Recognizing the powerful role of the arts in combating hate, he said, we need to build these human connections as only the arts can do. Also, while in Boston, I delivered the second annual Daniel Rinaldi lecture at Boston University's Metropolitan College. The title was Arts is Indispensable to Just and Equitable Communities. In my address, I repeated something that I believe in strongly, and it's something that I say often. One thing that I know for sure is that none of the things that we say we aspire to as a nation of opportunity and justice are possible without the intentional integration of arts, culture, and design into all facets of our lives and the systems we rely on to care for each other. The arts have to be integrated into other sectors and other fields because they are essential. In May, I had the pleasure to participate in the Ninth World Summit on Arts and Culture, organized by the International Federation of Arts Councils and Cultural Agencies in Stockholm, Sweden. I moderated the final plenary session called Pathways, Tools, and Resources to Advance Artistic Freedom. And as I noted in my introduction there, the arts are most powerful when con concerns about artistic freedom also include more expansive ways of inviting and supporting the participation of artists in how we shape our world. And just last week, I was in Pittsburgh where I delivered a keynote address at the League of American Orchestra's annual conference. The theme for their conference was Bridges to the Future, and this was an opportunity to share thoughts around how we can rebuild, rethink, and reimagine the role of the arts in forming healthy, equitable, and opportunity-rich communities around the nation. We also visited with NEA grantee Prime Stage during this visit to Pittsburgh, along with the Holocaust Center and Light Education Initiative. They're working to counter anti-Semitism through the arts and education. With every community I visited, I was reminded of how our mission is core to the well-being of our nation, and even more convinced of the power and the potential of the National Endowment for the Arts. Now, we'd like to share some presentations that illustrate the vibrant and immensely necessary arts and culture in this city and state. First up is Joycelyn Reynolds, the President and CEO of Arts New Orleans, 
a local arts agency which has been a grantee of the NEA for several years. She'll share with you some of the great work they've been doing and some of the projects they've been supporting. Thank you for joining us, Joyce Lynn. Good morning, and thank you, Dr. Jackson. I'm Joyce Lynn Reynolds, President and CEO of the Arts Council of New Orleans, and we've been doing business as Arts New Orleans since 2021. Our focus is the larger arts community, cultural policy. We have advocated and been successful for getting state, national, and city dollars that go out to the arts community in addition to our many programs that impact artists and the larger community. It's my pleasure to introduce one of our grantees, Candy Duga, who is the executive director of Dancing Grounds. Candy. Good morning. It is a wonderful pleasure to be here, and we are so thankful for the support of Arts New Orleans as well as the National Endowment for the Arts. Dancing Grounds is a dance community that is interested in what happens in community. We build community through dance. And one of our featured programs is Dance for Social Change, where our young people lead the way. They set the theme not only for their work throughout the year, but for us as an organization. And so we would love for our students to be here today, many of whom are students here at NOCA but they are enjoying their summer vacation. So we have provided a bit of their work via video. Hope you enjoy it. The Arts Council, Arts New Orleans, um, 10 years ago, we started a festival as a gift to the city of New Orleans. It's called Lunafet Art, Light, and Technology Festival. It is December 7th to 10th. Um, we're gonna celebrate our 10th anniversary. And we wanted to share light on the power, power of art to transform communities. Everyone knows New Orleans for its jazz and its cuisine, and we wanted to create an experience that combined New Orleans' dynamic creative fields of, con of contemporary art, film, and technology. So can we start the slides? Let's see. So Luna Fett was in inspired by Fête des Luminaires in Lyon, France, a festival of light which animates historic buildings using projection mapping technology. The first building we animated was Gallia Hall in downtown New Orleans. Gallia Hall was New Orleans City Hall for over 100 years, from 1853 to 1956. We also did Lunafet at Ache Cultural Arts Center, the powerhouse. 
Local youth created the projection with their drawings and were embedded in a projection using green screen technology. So we did um, our Luna Fed in Central City one year. Arts New Orleans has explored many facades for projections across the city. Some of our projections have explored, explored social issues of cultural equity and environmental preservation. We believe using art to communicate issues, including civic issues. Lunafet commissions local artists to explore new technology, provide opportunities for creative collaborations, and expand the scale of artist work. This image showcased the Piazza uh, Piano by local artist David Sullivan, which transformed the gate of the Piazza d'Italia into a giant interactive piano, which festival participants could play with their bodies. The blurred vision below, um, if you, it, on the other, is um, our dancing ground members wearing light up suits doing street performances. Lunafet works to showcase the potential in public spaces and animate buildings we see every day in a new light. Arts New Orleans believes art in everything and the viewing of all civic issues creatively can lead to a more beautiful and inspiring space for all to enjoy. In December of 2020, during the COVID pandemic, we produced light up art for the community that year, artwork were distance across the city to provide a moment of hope and inspiration during a challenging time. The picture on the left showcased the former St. Rose de Lima Church in December 2020. Three local artists created work interpreting the story of Andre Cayude, one of the first black captains in the nation, on the tower. This building is now home to the Andrew Cayude Cultural Justice Center. You can also see the pedestal at Harmony Circle in the picture on the right. Black poets were commissioned to write words projected to be projected on the pedestal based with lasers. The work was viewable at night in the key roundabout in our city, which viewers could enjoy and experience from the safety of their cars. Lunafet includes various types of artwork that includes light. A crowd favorite in 2019 was Pam Keaton's Dalai Lama. Um, from a vintage phone book, participants can speak to a sassy llama hologram projection in a horse, old horse trailer. <laughs> The artwork we present are selected by open call and a curated process. The magic of Lunafed experience attracts local and visitors, a very diverse crowd. Last year's festival held for four nights in December had over 50,000 visitors. Here we projected with electric girls, girls aged 11 to 13, creating a coloring book style freestyling uh, mural. This mural was designed by Youth in Arts New Orleans Young Artist Movement Program with artist mentor Langston Austin. It, is a it was projection mapped by uh, technology uh, that our, from our Young Artist Movement students. Last year, we collaborated with black fashion designers to create light up designs and present illuminated fashion show during the festival. Also last year, we had um, New Orleans Baby Dolls participation and two Mardi Gras Indian queens, including um, Sharice Harrison Nelson. She created a light up suit for the festival and her image was featured in the video mapping projection. 
Live performances are a hallmark of New Orleans culture and a practice that we celebrate as part of LUNAFET. LUNAFET provides a platform for New Orleans to look to the future and merge traditions with technology. The festival offers an opportunity for local artists to find new outlets and opportunities for creative expression. While LUNAFET spans four night yearly, the festival impact is felt year round. The key to our success is our investment in our artists. Our team provides professional training, skill development, and access to experts and resources from which artists uh, scale their work and explore new ideas. Here you can see a transition of Kettle Flower by local artist Josh, Josh Pitt from a temporary LunaFed installation in, 22, in 2020 to a permanent artwork in 2022. LunaFed also leaves a mark on our public spaces. Here are three permanent installations commissioned by LunaFed artists. Com but we commissioned, uh, you know, our New Orleans commission. Neon Rivers by Martin Benson and Janae de Blobla was created at the, at the Aloft Hotel in the Baronne Street. That's the first one, it's at the entryway. Iris of Memory is on Lafitte Greenway. It was created by Will Mennikoff, and it offers benches and a play space. And Vector Floor by Cordella Roser and Marcella D. Sonor helps illuminate the darkness and improve public safety in Duncan Plaza across from City Hall on Perdido Street. Thank you so much for coming out today and listening to what we do as Arts New Orleans. And what's most important about LunaFed is that it would not be possible without funding from the National Endowment for the Arts. So I'd like to thank the chairman and her team. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments from council? That, yeah. Thank, Thank you for you. sharing. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Joycelyn. Thank you, Candy. Um, and uh, next, I'd like to introduce an artist, storyteller, and former councilwoman of South Louisiana's uh, United Homa Nation, Monique Verdun. Uh, Monique. Monique's practice focuses on the ways of life in the bayou in the heart of the Mississippi River Delta. A number of her current projects have focused on indigenous heritage and preservation, climate justice and resilience, and building civic connection and mutual aid infrastructure for community transformation. Monique will share some of what she's been working on. And Monique, we are so grateful for you joining us today. Um, Halito, hello, good morning, afternoon, depending on where you are and what time it is. Um, I just want to give gratitude for your ancestors and mine that have made it possible for us to be here in this space together. Um, I'm going to share a bit of my story and some images of folks that I love and um, places that are rapidly disappearing that I also love so deeply. Um, <laughs> this is a ghost forest, and um, I, I have been stewarding a project called the Land Memory Bank and Seed Exchange since 2015. And I've been using this technique of layering maps um, from the United States Geological Survey with um, images from the places that the maps are, are in um, to, to really layer time and space and, and, and place. And this is um, Point of Chien or Point of Chien, depending on who you ask, Point of the Oaks or Point of the Dog. But we're losing land here at one of the most rapid rates on the planet. The statistic is that every 90 minutes a football field is lost from our shores, which we hear over and over again. And the reality of what that looks like and how rapidly we're seeing it change before our eyes has really been um, 
what has inspired so much of my response um, in creating this, this body of work <laughs> that is connected to so many networks and other individuals and communities who have been, um, who have been uh, teaching and inspiring and wrestling with these realities with me. In 2007, I received a restoration residency right after Hurricane Katrina. It felt right after, even though it was two years. And um, that was a great gift from a studio in the woods <clears throat> that changed my life. I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm being really emotional. I feel like, why does the NEA have me talking? <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then here I have, and then I asked who the audience was, and they said, well, the United States. And I thought, I have so much to tell. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, I, you know, I mean, I think that if I could say anything right now, that artists need safe spaces to be in, clean water to drink, air to breathe, and safe soil to stand on. And I've been telling this really sad story. Um, next slide, please. I don't have control of the slides, which is making me feel very uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to orient us in place and, um, you know, the Yakni Shido, uh, the big country found between the Atchafalaya and Mississippi rivers is where that image of the ghost forest is from and where my ancestors from the Homa Nation are from and where we are still living, but where we are rapidly having to face challenges and change and decisions to, um, to move north or to figure out ways to remain and reclaim and adapt during this time of rapid sea level rise. And, um, and, and violent assaults against our communities due to petrochemical, community, petrochemical multinational corporations. Next slide, please. So the Yakni Shido just, I'm sorry, can we go back? <laughs> Um, is this the Mississippi coming down, right? We're in the Big Bend right now here in Bulbuncha, New Orleans, and um, the Atchafalaya, which is the same river, but that Mississippi has been uh, switching back and forth for between 5,000 and 8,000 years. And so I just wanna, before we go to the next slide, acknowledge the Mississippi River, um, because if there was no Mississippi, we would have no land to stand upon to acknowledge here. And that life force connects us all the way up um, to the headwaters, or so-called headwaters, many headwaters, many tributaries, many waterways. 41% of the continental uni United States is flowing through that waterway system. So if you haven't had a chance to visit Mississippi while you're here, please go and see her. Next slide, please. Um, nature does not create straight lines, and this perspective is really unique here in South Louisiana as everything is flat, or most of the time we're looking up at levee walls. Um, and so this is in the heart of the Yakni Shido, and you see this earthen levee, and behind this disappearing landscape. Next slide, please. Um, in 2012, we released a documentary called My Louisiana Love, which is a um, you know, kind of puts a parenthesis around the last hundred years um, from a HOMA perspective and multi-generational perspective. We see this map a lot. This is um, what's projected by 2050, our land loss. Um, and, and most of the HOMA nation lives in, in this red zone, as well as um, other indigenous um, nations, the petite nations who have remained since um, you know, I say that land loss did not begin with sea level rise. Our real fight with land loss began with colonization, um, and we've been adapting and shifting and moving um, ever since. And um, next slide, please. This place, Ile de Jean Charles, you may have heard about in the news recently um, over the last couple of years. Um, this was one of the first climate relocation federally funded communities, um, which received uh, $45 million a few years ago to relocate the whole community. Um, it's changed a bit. Things are changing at the ends of the bayous. Um, I, I often say the places that are becoming more and more vulnerable are the ones that are becoming more and more desirable. So whether you're inside here, New Orleans, the, the concrete lily pad which we are, we are standing upon, or whether you're outside at the ends of the roads, you're seeing this kind of gentrification that's happening. And, um, and he, for, for this part of the world, it's sports fishing. 
Um, you move people away from their bayou side, you move homo people away from their bayou side, you're losing, you're, leave, you're taking them away from their place to literally feed themselves and their families, their place of business and, um, and celebration. Next slide, please. This is a elder of Viviane Hotard. Again, this technique of, of layering place and time, and um, and this is Pont Barre, where oil and gas was first um, dredged in, or first uh, found in coastal Louisiana. There's no community there. But, uh, Viviane witnessed the kind of exodus, um, which many people are are now also facing. Um, you know, all of these uh, almost 100 years later, in a different kind of way. Next slide, please. This map, I've been working with a lot of different collaborators, some in the room today, um, but uh, this map is J Jacob Rosenzweig um, made this map of all of the pipelines and petrochemical facilities, so you can just visualize this. I just would like folks to really pay attention to South Louisiana right now when we're talking about the green revolution that we're in and that carbon capture sequestration is being put forward as a solution and it's a false solution. It's taking dirty carbon and wanting to inject it deep beneath us <laughs> as a solution and, and people are, are at the Capitol right now um, talking about this. Uh, additionally, there's this expansion of liquefied natural gas terminals all along the Gulf South, um, specifically here in South Louisiana, which is also incredibly dangerous. And because of the um, conflict in Ukraine, um, these projects are moving forward at a very rapid, very dangerous rate. So next slide, please. Um, in 2010, of course, we experienced the BP drilling disaster and had the Gulf of Mexico bleeding sweet crude for over three months. So we've been kind of riding this wave of disaster and we see how resources come in during those times, but um, the climate crisis, there is no end. So finding resilient solutions is really the pathway forward. Next slide, please. Um, in 2013, I worked on this collaborative project, Cry You One, where we took folks on a mile and a half procession along the ghost forest in St. Bernard Parish, just south of here, to this um, uh, by default natural, uh, unnatural waterway where fresh water was being reintroduced to the wetlands and there was a baby cypress forest that was growing. And this kind of theatrical storytelling uh, awareness, when at the end of the day, when people would say, well, how did the show go? I would say, well, we got 60 people out into the wetlands for this experience that really was transformative for many people's lives, especially my own, which is why um, the Land Memory Bank was seated. Next slide, please. Um, the Land Memory Bank has been working on a number of site-specific activations, as well as gathering stories, um, planting seeds, and sharing them. And Invisible Rivers is part performance, part exhibition, um, part educational um, experience with community using a float lab, which is a piece of infrastructure we've been building out with boat builders, HOMA boat builders here in the south. And, um, and this beautiful image is by Pippin Frisbee Calder, who's a dear friend of ours and was made for the, um, the People's WPA during the times of COVID as, um, as artists who are, who, you know, the, the, the importance of artists in being able to, to build a path forward and um, a future forward. And we've also been working with a K through 12 water literacy um, uh, organization called Ripple Effect, which has been really beautiful. Next slide, please. Okay, so back to the beginning of my story, which is Grand Bois, Big Woods. Um, this is a toxic waste pit, and in 1998, when I was 18 years old, I learned about this place and my family being poisoned. Next slide, please. The facility is still there in a flood zone. Um, some of the pits are being closed, we hear, but there's also injection wells that are there in Grand Bois. When Hurricane Ida hit with 185 mile per hour winds um, in 2021, Grand Bois was a site where artists <laughs> were on the front lines with mutual aid, bringing supplies, bringing solar generators, bringing whatever we could. Um, my cousins who live in Grand Bois asked if we could try to build in community a replica of our ancestral home, which is in this um, bottom right hand corner. The photograph was taken in the 1920s, Mademoiselle Chimney, Palmetto Roof, Cypress House. 
Um, a lot's changed since then, but this replica house is, is we, we broke ground on it uh, just this past weekend, and, um, and will be a solar medicine house where people can come in good times and in bad, um, where our elders and artists can share their skills and their traditional ways, um, where we can have celebrations, and when in need, um, it can be a battery charging station and a place for water distribution. Next slide, please. And we're gonna have medicine gardens. Um, We've been also working, uh, the Neighborhood Story Project and I, on a project called Botanica. Um, and thanks to the National Performance Network for um, the Southern Artists for Social Change um, um, support, we've been able to continue this work and are currently planning for an exhibition in 2024 with the Louisiana State Museum at the Cabildo. But we've been working with a spectrum of herbalists, um, garden keepers, um, mushroom wise men, um, and, and many more, and doing a real survey and capture of the gardens that are growing here, um, the gardens that have grown in the past across the Delta, the Atchafalaya, Mississippi River basins, and, um, and also the future gardens that are being seeded now. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm being long-winded. I have one last thing that I'm really excited to share and invite folks to, um, to join us. Prospect is, uh, Prospect New Orleans is helping to support a project with a collective of intertribal folks here in Bulbuncha, Bulbuncha, place of many tongues or many languages, as the shock talk called it. Um, and so we will be building an earthen mound here in Bulbuncha sometime soon, um, and, um, and also be planting medicine gardens as well, and it will be an invitation for, for everyone to, um, to join with us. So um, thank you, and I probably went over time. Thank you, slide next slide person, whoever is back there. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> Hold on, can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you, Monique. Thank you for sharing your, your practice and your passion so much. Um, are there any questions or comments from council? I'm curious about where um, your funding comes from. Oh, thank you, NEA. Um, <laughs> some of the, so the restoration residents, when I was asking friends, um, I said I was speaking today, and I was like, what is, uh, so yeah, friends were reminding me, the restoration residency from a studio in the woods came from the NEA. Um, funding for Cry You One came from the NEA, and the pre present work that I'm doing with Mondo Bizarro and, um, and Jeff Becker uh, with Invisible Rivers is also from the NEA. So, um, yes, it's important, um, and uh, we are so grateful <laughs> for that. That's, that's um, important funding. I'm just curious if the community has come in behind that funding to supplement. The community, uh, you mean here in the... The business community, perhaps? Business community, not so much. Um, uh, so I, I didn't go here. I wanted to. Um, but, you know, given our circumstance um, with the oil and gas industry, um, a lot of funding is coming through those channels here, not so much for the work that we're doing, but for a lot of the work that is happening um, a lot of our museums and cultural institutions and educational places are funded by, you know, Shell Oil, the Helis Foundation, um, these other petrochemical um, companies who are moving little bits of money there, um, you know, so, so it's really um, complicated. Um, I mean, it's complicated in so many ways uh, here. I think that... Um, you know, the, the, the reality of being in Cancer Alley and the wealth that is made here and the little bits of, of funding that come through and the sacrifices that um, we are all making. I mean, you're in a place that has some of the worst air quality in the nation. So when you walk outside, I mean, we're right here by, by all of, I mean, we're in a school steps away from oil tankers. I don't know if you guys noticed that when you came in, it surrounds us. Um, and we've had to make the ultimate sacrifices. And also, you know, we're on a PowerPoint for the planet. Like, this is a place that is, has some of the, the most biodiversity 
in the world and cultural diversity too. And so I think we have to have both of those. We need to have safe, healthy places to be in order for culture to thrive and in order for the arts to really inform and inspire. And we need infrastructure. Yes, we need, we need levees and walls, but we need infrastructure for people to live and learn and to be and to grow in good ways that are sustainable. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you, Monique. Um, our third and last presentation is about Louisiana music. Uh, we'll look at the musical culture of Louisiana, specifically jazz in New Orleans, and Cajun music out of Lafayette. And we have two experts here to talk about that, NEA jazz master Donald Harrison Jr. and NEA heritage fellow Michael Doucet. Uh, and to lead the discussion, we have folklorist and broadcaster, as well as newly minted NEA heritage fellow, Nick Spitzer. Thank you for joining us. Nick, Michael, and Donald. Uh, I didn't, did you introduce these guys? Or is that my job? Oh, we know who we are. Oh, good. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for being, being here in New Orleans, everybody. And, and are some of you here uh, other than the council members? Is it all council members here today? Oh, there's Monique. Yeah, yeah. Members, can you hear me? There's council members at the table okay. and on, on uh, video. Well, okay. I don't know if you can see can't see them now. Okay, this is but great. But there there are council members joining online. Yeah. Uh, there is the public who is live here in New Orleans, and it's streaming nationally. Oh my gosh! Well, we could be there's people watching us we don't even know about all across the globe, no doubt. <laughs> well, it's good. Uh, you know, New Orleans is New Orleans is kind of a, a powerful local and global city. Uh, it's sort of a global city of a, maybe another century back sometimes, uh, but. Uh, it's increasingly aware of all the important things that it's given to the world, and uh, there's a lot of interesting changing consciousness here. Um, I host public radio, and I was told to uh, say something about myself be because I received a Heritage Award. And you know, they said, well, you're not a culture bearer. And, which, and that term culture bearer has always kind of been funny to me. It's like you're carrying something on your back, and it's <laughs> difficult. Um, but I have a culture too, and, and my culture was partly came from my mother, was, who was a single child uh, 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 of, a, uh, of a single mother, uh, a suffragette. And uh, we grew up partly in New York and partly in rural Connecticut, always feeling that um, we should be citizens uh, and take care of other people, get to know who they were. And so as a child, I was exposed to, uh, you know, girls playing double dutch in the street while I was trying to ride my tricycle around. And double dutch people don't like you to ride your trike through, you know, <laughs> jump rope. So I learned quick, you know, I would respect the double dutch. And, and at the same time, uh, there were all these uh, Puerto Rican kids in New York who were on sort of skateboards and uh, maybe a little fruit crate turned sideways and they were blasting around. So I early on was exposed and thought quite a bit about a cultural difference. And then in rural Connecticut, uh, my mother always took us to places where she wanted us to meet. The game warden was a Native American, Uncas, and knew everything about the woods. And I it just, you know, my image of Indians was Hollywood, and here's this man in his rubber boots and working through the woods. Uh, and then there were all the witch hazel harvesters, mostly, uh, you know, old school Yankees uh, and shad fishermen. And so coming to respect all those people, and uh, my town, the only person of color in my town of Old Lyme was the French teacher who was from Martinique, uh, and a wonderful man. Um, but who, who brought us... Who brought us Sam Cook, Otis Redding, and Wilson Pickett? Sicilians. Sicilians who were at the bottom of the social order. So I began to feel there were these cultural things that I needed to learn about to be, to be a true American. I mean, I felt, I felt patriotism about it. And it, this, this went on through my life. In college, I left uh, the Wharton School after one semester and went into folklore and anthropology. I think my father was going to have a conniption fit. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, what am I doing 50 years later? Folklore, anthropology, and the other key, radio, which you couldn't study, but you could run the student station. So I've been lucky. 
And I, I think of myself as privileged in the sense that I've had a privilege to be free to do the work I've wanted to do. And, and I, I'm glad I got the Heritage Award. It, it was fun and interesting to find out about it. I've been involved with the program. But the work, I didn't do the work to get a, a, an award. I do it because I, I enjoy the people I meet. I enjoy thinking about it. I want to make America a place that puts itself back together around its great inclusivities and diversities. And so, so that's, how, that's me. And uh, uh, my job today is to be the radio host and the stage host and talk about <laughs> these guys, with these guys. And uh, so uh, Donald Harrison is someone I've known over the years, and I've been kidding him backstage. We go, go to the mother-in-law lounge. I hear him honking R&B. Uh, we hear him on American Roots, he unfolds hip-hop, soul, modern jazz. Uh, I find out he plays classical music. He's done all kinds of things. He flew in, I think, at 5 a.m. this morning from Kansas City, where he's uh, been working uh, with uh, somebody that's in quantum physics. Uh, I, I never am surprised when I find out something new. But Donald, I guess I wanted to start with your family. Could you say a little about your, I know your mom's still with us and an amazing force. Your father is not also an amazing force. Maybe you could say a little bit about that, and I guess we should pull your mic in. Here we go. Yeah, I, I grew up in a uh, an amazing household because uh, it was an inclusive household. We listened to, uh, in terms of music, since I'm a musician, we listened to almost every kind of music that you can imagine, uh, from field recordings in Africa, uh, Indian music, almost every kind of music that you can imagine, from the Americas and uh, musicals that that were on in the movies, you know, uh, classical music, everything. Ed, you, we we would go from Etta James for one song to uh, Shostakovich, to uh, what they call pygmy music, from, and then with a, with a side of uh, the hills are alive with the sound of music. <laughs> <laughs> so, who, was in charge, who was in charge of the record player? Mostly my father, but my mother was also uh -huh. part, part of that paradigm. Uh, and, she, and she was just like my father. And, and the other part of it is my father was uh, the person who mostly took me around to, to second lines and to uh, tribal uh, gatherings. Yeah. So and he was a big chief. He was a big, my father was a big chief. But uh, he mostly took me, the, the guys would go out to the second lines. Mm -hmm. When I, I remember that, and go, to go see all types of music. Mm -hmm. I remember even, uh, he used to take me to, to see Cajun musicians oh. and initially. I liked the music, but I, it felt like it was going backwards some kind of way because of the accordion. But, <laughs> I, but now... It's the original quantum feeling. The, the, the original quantum <laughs> idea of music. But uh, <laughs> I, I still enjoyed it immensely. And I think uh, being in that kind of background was the start of me uh, wanting to understand all music. And it has led me to the place I am as a musician. But the other part is Charlie Parker, reading what Charlie Parker said when I was in high school, I always say this, him saying that if you don't live it, it won't come out of your horn. Hmm. And they teach you there's a boundary line to art, and there is none. Mm. But it, it, it's in those two sentences he summed up everything that an artist can do, mm. because you can you're, you're the sum uh, for me now. You're the sum of your experiences and whatever talent that the universe gives you. Uh, well, and, okay, uh, go ahead. I was just say, I mean, you're a jazz master, and New Orleans is historically known to many people as a town of New Orleans traditional jazz. And some people know it in tourism terms as Dixieland, though that's kind of finally fading. I hope so. Hope so. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> what, what, I mean, being able to hear all that kind of music, it seems to me you, you were different than a lot of New Orleanians growing up. 
because if they're growing up with something people were calling jazz, it was probably more likely to be New Orleans traditional jazz for a street parade or you know, a funeral or something like that. So your family seems to have set you on a course of wider, wider understandings of music and culture. Yeah, uh, I think that may be true. I, I can't uh, explain what was going on in other people's houses, but we definitely had that at our house. But the thing that brought it all together was Charlie Parker, and, and then me realizing, wait a minute, you can, you're at a point where you can play the music from New Orleans, and you can, the guys who were, every era of jazz musicians were still alive. Mm -hmm. So I made a plan to play with every generation of uh, jazz artists and blues artists and every kind of music that I could so that when I played, I would have the experience, I would have lived it, yeah. and, it and what was coming out of my horn would be honest, like yeah. Charlie Parker said. And, and, and I was able to accomplish that. Right. Well, and you're speaking to the idea of, of a, a community of people because you're, you're playing with them face to face. You may have listened to records, but right. you also played with Art Blakey. Yeah, there's no, there's no, when I was with Art Blakey, he sort of made me his confidant. Mm. So I, I was always the one in the car with him, and he was explaining all of these things. I, I guess because I, I really love Charlie Parker, and I, everybody who played with Charlie Parker, every time I saw him, I just... I knew I was going to be asking him, what Charlie Parker tell you? What did Charlie, how, how did you play with Charlie Parker? Yeah. And why did you do this? And, and so they would start explaining. And then I got closer because I, I think I was the only one who was really asking those questions about yeah. Charlie. And they loved him. Art Blakey, Miles Davis, uh, all the guys who played with Charlie, they revered him because he taught all of them. Yeah. But uh, Art Blakey used to say, you can't beat experience. So here's, here's the same idea that Charlie Parker, and, and initially I was like, what is he talking about? But then I realized when I started teaching younger people, you can, I can't really tell them what it feels like to play with those guys. Like I can write a song and I can think about how, just simple things like how hard Art Blakey would hit the drums right here. All these experiences, or, or Miles Davis telling me this is the secret to bebop that Charlie Parker, that you can't get unless you're around these people. Mm -hmm. Or them telling, explaining, Roy Haynes explaining what Charlie Parker was telling him uh, about something called question and answer in the music. Right. If you don't talk to them and get on the bandstand and work those things out, yeah. it's imp you can't... Communicate with the music. Yeah, in, but in then that you can give some of that information to younger musicians and it can help them to have the depth mm. of the whole history of the music. Right. But unless you really spend time with those people, you can't know what it feels like to play in front of Art Blakey. Right. So you can't use that. And even with the culture, if you've never been in that circle with another big chief, <laughs> yeah. you, you can't say this is what, you can't use that as your experience. So now all the things that Charlie Parker taught me with those two sentences uh, are coming to fruition, I think. Yeah, that's great. The uh, interesting thing to me when I think of the jazz masters is that there is a tradition in jazz, but jazz tends to be thought of as dominantly some kind of creative something that's beyond tradition. But it is both tied to what came before. You're talking about intimate groups playing together. And yes, it has the creativity. And, and maybe the flip side image we've had of Cajun music is that it's all sort of received wisdom from days gone by. Uh, but this, this is a young man here who uh, played in arguably the Cajun version of The Grateful Dead at one point. Uh, I know because I went to a lot of those shows. <laughs> I, not just The Grateful Dead, uh, the, the band called Koto, which means higher ground. Uh, and and uh, at the same time has been able to innovate uh, mm -hmm. within the tradition. So the idea that there's a jazz master and a heritage recipient, I think tradition and creativity often go together and you make statements at different times. So Michael, let me ask you about your sense of growing up and, and your family and, and how it led you uh, to be holding the violin there today. Le violon. Le violon. Well, mm. um, they had a, 
None of my parents played music. They played the radio. But my father loved jazz. <laughs> Nothing he wrong with that. Louis Armstrong, <laughs> my God. And that's, that's all we listened to. Huh? I played trumpet for a while. But one side of the family was, was educated. They all became nuns and priests. I mean, I don't know why, but they, they, were, they played pianos, and, and another cousin played trombone. The other side played violin, trumpet, and, and, uh, and banjo, and we'd get together at these family reunions, and who knows what kind of music we played. I was always interested in music that moved you. And uh, so we had a relative, uh, just for a name, his name was T. Will, is a nickname. And he played violin, and, uh, amongst other instruments, but he also had a racetrack. And in southwest Louisiana, it wasn't the oval racetrack, it was a quarter horse racetrack, which is a quarter of a mile straight. And they would put me, it was called the China Ball Racetrack, it was between our house and his house, so they put me on top of this tree, and with a flag, whoever won the race. And my mother told me she didn't want me to hang around with him, so of course that's what I did. Uh, <laughs> and he taught, taught me three songs on the violin. You know, one's called Alonso Lafayette, um, Jolie Belong, and this blues that I thought was a Cajun blues, which ended up being St. Louis blues. And to me, that was the basis of my, my music right there. This is, this is what I wanted to do. Um, just growing up, I took it for granted. My father would bring me out to hear people. I mean, that's what I heard Lawrence Walker. You'd go out there, I'd open the beer cans. Great accordionist. Yeah. And, um, but it wasn't until, for me, the, really, the revelation was when I was at LSU as a freshman. I took an easy course called Anglo-Saxon Folk Songs by, um, what was his name? Uh, okay, George Foss. That's right. You know that, 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 that whole thing. And so we went through Anglo, you know, we went through blues, we went to Native American, went to child ballads. This isn't, what about French music in Southwest Louisiana? Oh, that's just translated English songs. <laughs> oh, really? So it, after the class, I went directly to the archives at LSU, found Oster's, Harry Oster's things, and of course did my paper and got an A and proved them wrong. And, uh, and that's what kind of started me to do. I didn't even think you could do this in our music. Our music was just an oral music. It was like the next door neighbor playing this music. I mean, it's like any, everybody played. My father's sisters, three of them all sang ballads, mm. which we had begrudgingly had to learn but when I first went to France as a representative of this, I mean, it was just my cousin and I, Ralph, we were, we were playing in a bar, and of course, for free drinks, young kids seek, you know, speaking French, and this promoter came in from France. Do you want to go to France to play music? Oh, yeah, why not, you know? Well, we were supposed to go for two weeks, I stayed six months. <laughs> and they were having their folk revival in France, and I heard people my age, of course, French people, singing the same ballads that my aunts were. That kind of blew my mind. Mm. And so then I realized how much I didn't know. Right. But the possibilities, and that's what we were talking about before, to me it was, it was French music, the basis of French music. Okay, we were Acadians. We had a lot of ballads, story songs, and things like that. But what happened in Louisiana, I was, I was totally uh, enamored with the colonialization of New Orleans and how it was formed and also the music, especially when they closed Storyville. And some of the musicians moved to southwest Louisiana. The most prominent, perhaps, is Bunk Johnson, right. who we talked about, Hippolyte Charles, mm -hmm. who actually played with Buddy Bolden. I got to meet him, interview him with Austin Saunier, and he was telling me about some of the stuff, so how close it was then. And so I asked Cajuns, hmm. did, you, did you ever hear you know, the, the Black Eagle Orchestra? And they said, oh man, we had to dress up to go hear them. You know, so it was, the music was, was, I'm not saying it was like a church or anything like that, but there was a certain, ethereal quality that lifted you out of your state. We grew up as poor people. I mean, it's, it, it just, it, it's just the way it is, but it didn't, that wasn't even a thing. Mm. When you look at the Acadian people, when they when actually migrated to the New World as early as 1604, basically until 1755 when, when what is it, 12,000 were deported, basically it wasn't a structure. They, were, they, they formed the first democratic government there. They lived amongst the Mi'kmaq Indians. And they were the true North, they were, they were natives. I mean, Nick and I would talk about that. Joe Wilson, who used to be head of the NCTA, said, well, there's three things. The major part, when the colonization of the world, you have the Spanish, the English, and the French. The Spanish will pretty much kill the leaders. The English will make you bow down, bow down to the crown. And the French, they'll make love to you. So it's a whole different <laughs> approach. And, but that's the music. And you have to kind of let go 
to play this music because our music is not written down. I don't think you could, I mean, you, I've, I've done a lot of things trying to, you know, I've written songs, etc. But our music is, is how you feel. It mm -hmm. comes from the feeling and where you at, where you're at, just like Donald was saying, just like Charlie Parker was saying, you're as good as, it's like the James Booker <laughs> school right. of music. I mean, you, there's, there's no classical, there's no folk, it's all the same thing. Classical music is formed from folk music. Mm -hmm. Well, but you, you did something that I think it, it helped you get close to the oral tradition in, in a somewhat similar way to what he's been saying about jazz musicians, is you went out eventually and started interviewing people, yeah, yeah. probably with a grant from the NEA. Uh, That's a story <laughs> about that. Thank you, Albert. Uh, yeah. But yeah, but I mean, you interviewed dozens of people yeah. and played with them and learned from them in living rooms and playing in bandstands. And you know, you taught yourself by going to the masters around you. Thank you. And thanks to you. I mean, we did that. Nick and I have been friends for a long time in the yeah. 70s. And that's what I was doing. And then Nick said, well, I'm doing this. And, you know, I got this grant. I said, grant? He said, you ought to apply for grants. They give grants to Cajuns. I swear, it's a college graduate who said this. Because we were second class citizens. So yeah. why would they give it to us? And, of course, I applied. And I got one. Thank you very much. And But now I could see what it did. So for me, I wanted to see what... I kind of where, where this music came from. For me, I was always looking for the blues part of the music. We know the French create beautiful melodies. Not too much rhythm. So the rhythm is from Native American, it's from here, it's, it's from Creoles, it's from Africans of origin. It's, it's all mixed up together. And people say, well, you play, you play the same kind of music they play in Nova Scotia? Not even close. Yeah, it's very different. Because it's, it's here. So yeah, and thanks to you, I did get that grant. I got to meet people, <laughs> knock on doors, and we became friends, and, and it was a one-on-one -on -one basis. Yeah. And I wasn't trying to do anything. I was just trying to learn this music. Mm -hmm. And for me, is to bring these people out, like Dennis McGee, to go, I didn't see Dennis. Dennis was born in the 1890s. And I'd go see him every week, and, uh, and sometimes I'd miss. And he said, where you been? I said, well, I was on tour. He said, how come you don't take me? You know, he's like 85 <laughs> years old. Dennis, where do you want to go? New York City. You've got to be kidding. Okay, so I took him up to New York City, did a great concert, except that night they had a little Cajun restaurant by Abe Delahousie called uh, La Louisiane, and Dennis ate cornbread and, and, uh, and a fried catfish, which he shouldn't, so the next morning he woke up, he thought he was having a heart attack. Now his, his brother-in-law said he was there, man, Dennis, all you need is a little filet, you know, a little drink of whiskey. Didn't work, so we took him to the hospital. I said, Dennis is not going to die in my shot. Took him to the hospital. They, I don't think they've ever seen anybody that old alive. So I brought his fiddle. His, his heartbeat was going like this, blah, blah, blah. Brought him his fiddle. Perfect. But they, so I had to do the concert. That was the hardest concert I ever did. I had to do it for Dennis McGee. So I brought him back home uh, the next day. It was, it was, it was, and we stole him out of the, the, the hospital because he didn't have insurance. Anyway... The, the point is that we get to back to his house and his wife, Gladys, said, Dennis, you behave? And Dennis said, oh, yeah. He said, do you bring me a souvenir? And Dennis opened his shirt, and he still had the little patches from his AKG. <laughs> but this man played yeah, with yeah. a black accordion player. He was a genius. His name is Amadeo Duan. He recorded in 1929. He was still alive to me. That was, that, that was who I wanted to be. Mm. And sometimes I'd get frustrated. I know, Donald, if you ever got frustrated playing, but I said, man, I, I can't see how you play that, you know? And his wife would say, man, Mike, he's been playing 60 years old, longer than you. It's okay. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, one thing we should say, and I want to switch back to Donald, is that um, the, the Cajuns were known as les petits habitants, uh, the small farmer. And, and much of South Louisiana was controlled by plantation society. And most of it was French. And then little by little Americans, the French more in sugarcane and, and American, you know, in cotton. And of course, there were enslaved people. There were free people of color, uh, Native Americans. It's a complex society. And New Orleans being the kind of center point of its complexity. But Cajuns were not at the top of the economic ladder. They were, they were down low. And, and so, so as Cajun music, it was sort of a sign of, well, you're a backwoods person and it's not important. And a lot of educators repressed it for years and years and years until probably, what, maybe the 60s and 70s, when a French movement somewhat based on African-Americans seizing and saying black is beautiful, civil rights legislation, 
Cajuns and other ethnic groups were inspired by that to come forward as well. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, to me, a, a fascinating reality in Louisiana that, that all these different groups sort of found their way forward. But l I want to come back to a couple of those things, but let's go back uh, to you. Um, I don't know how, uh, you know, you, he, this man has been through quite a bit in the last few weeks. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. Uh, but um, is, there, is there a tune that comes to mind that somehow can uh, introduce your musical personality without going maybe all the way to quantum physics, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll get to that, I think. Uh, but uh, is there something, you know, just a tune you, maybe you could give us uh, in, in a small way, and then we'll come back to Mike, and then we'll do something together at the end? Yeah, there's a, uh, I could do a, a, a little chant and play the call and response chant, play the chant on my saxophone and do the, the call on my saxophone. I don't think I've ever done that before. So. Well. It might be You're with, here with an arts crowd and they're That's all right. about, you know, what's new and improvised in some cases. But you're building on tradition with it. Yeah. Right? You, you wouldn't have the chant to come from if you didn't have that tradition. True. Well, you could do it, but I came from it, so it's a different experience, maybe. I just want to say before I start, all the stuff I was talking about, how, how I came to, to my place in music, it... it uh, it's not a rule book for music and that sometimes there's an anomaly that happens and a person can do things that you can't even imagine yeah. that they should know about. And everything is open, there's n there is no rules for how a person gets to where they are. And we, we, uh, we have to accept that. And being a traditionalist is not the only way and playing from the traditional perspective of you learn from the masters and you and and then you find your your, your way it's not the only way so I, I just wanted to say that so here's here's a little chant with call and response chant me doing the call and the response for myself <laughs> 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 could say a little something about uh, your sense that uh, your great focus really is uh, on Afro New Orleans culture, both through your family uh, and your own actions, uh, you know, with your uh, Congo Nation group and that sort of thing. I mean, that's, that's something that's tied to your music identity, the family, the city. Yeah, well, we have a great place here in New Orleans that uh, I call a root contributor to uh, the music of the Americas in that place is Congo Square. And now I am the accepted uh, chief of Congo Square, which is something I can't even believe that is true. But this is a place where Africans were allowed to play, to participate in their homeland culture. So that had a tremendous effect on them and the people who, who saw them, and also the music that was produced here. So uh, you can hear, on, I can hear, I don't know if everybody can hear, but I can hear the uh, exact things that came from Africa 
that were placed in, into early jazz music, mm -hmm. you know, uh, on the recordings that uh, Louis Armstrong did with King Oliver so, and other, other recordings. I'm hearing the same things that we do in the culture uh, uh, that's still being done today that was on those recordings and uh, the places that comes from in, in Africa. There's some, some of the same stuff that's in Cuban music mm -hmm. in different places. So it's spread amongst the Americas. But what we did with it here was the contributor to jazz. So I, I've always thought that it was uh, important to honor the people who uh, who were at the bottom, the true bottom <laughs> of society, mm -hmm. who were keeping the, their uh, their ties to where they came from, mm -hmm. because they they took their names. The only thing that was left was the music and the culture right. to give them a sense of who they were, and some of the jazz musicians did enunciate upon that, and. Uh, the old timers I was around in the culture, they they enunciated that to me. Right. So I I think it's important that we put that in the universe because uh, it's the balance of honoring everybody and that and the importance of everyone. Well, um, Congo Square uh, physically on the map is above the French Quarter, towards the lake a little bit. Uh, at the edge of Treme, I guess, in, on the map of today. Uh, and most of what we have about it back into the 18th century are travelers' accounts, mm -hmm. and really up into the 19th century. Right. But, and these are mostly white travelers, journalists, explorers, reporting, occasionally some local people reporting. Um, but it seems that, that you make a pretty clear connection between Congo Square and the free day was the Sunday you know, under the French regime uh, and then carried forward and it sometimes was banned and it came back and there was a strategy of keeping people in one place. There were Native Americans that came, it was a trading place, it was a place of ritual, festival, dance and music. But I guess the big statement you're making from my perspective that not people for a long time wouldn't make is that there's a direct linkage uh, between the music, the continuity from there into the creation of jazz. Well, I'm actually not the person that's making that statement. It was some of the, well, I, well I'm, I'm re-enunciating it because I know that, but uh. I'm not the person who, who made that bold statement first. It was some of the early jazz musicians right. who said that who, first. Uh, who, who, if, if you really study history, yeah. you will see that they were, they were saying that. Were saying it through their music or in their it was, words? They were saying it, and they were also saying that it was their connection okay. to Africa. Yeah. That the music uh, kept the feeling of the roots of who they were. Right. And it was their connection, okay. the, the connection that kept them grounded in being... Uh, close to where they came from. It okay. was the only way that they could do it. They said that. Yeah. yeah. Um, some people say that jazz, when jazz begins that they've taken maybe a Sousa march, maybe they've taken a French song, taken something from the Caribbean, gospel music certainly, popular songs, and then the next line is, and jazzed it up. Yeah, well. How, how do you feel about that kind of description of yeah. those elements coming together? Jazz is always, uh, has always been an inclusive music. You know, uh, I, I came up with a statement. The uh, musicians who are inclusive find an exclusive sound. <laughs> <laughs> because they're adding other elements to what, what they do. If you're exclusive, then you, you continue the sound that you're exclusive in. Mm -hmm. You know, you were saying about his experiences, how he was including other things. Yeah. So then you, you have this hybrid, which is what America is about, which is what the world has always been around anyway, because yeah. humanity keeps forging forward for the good and the bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's, it's what human beings do. So uh, 
and there's different perspectives. There, there is such a thing as an Irish American perspective. There is such a thing as an Italian American perspective. There is such a thing as a Japanese American perspective. And there is such a thing as an African American perspective. You know, I was, when they were saying African Americans, there were a lot of people, we get into philosophical stuff now, but I think it's important. They said, why, why, why can't you just be an American? We are just Americans. But I, I would ask them, well, why don't, don't you have the problem with Japanese Americans saying they're Japanese Americans? Why is it the only people that you have a problem saying that they have another hybrid part to their culture as African Americans? Why are we the only people who can't have a perspective and a feeling that, that we know is a part of our collective? Mm -hmm. So we have a collective and a feeling that we understand, but we include other people inside of it. But you have to respect that this is a perspective and, and, the, and those people are important. Right. Their perspective is important. Yeah. <laughs> I, I totally, totally agree. It's the same thing. When you, when, when you were talking about music, that was our release. Mm -hmm. The music that our ancestors played when they were you know, deported from Nova Scotia was not that same kind of music. It was the music here. And there were always people, you were talking about perspective. If you had a mother and you did something wrong, then you knew who the boss was. <laughs> so you had a perspective of get in line. And I think when you, you the, the respect that we had when our elders played the music was to, because that's the way the world was. And that's the way it was for them. And everybody was who they were. And what we tried to do is assimilate that, but it can never be the same thing. But at the same time, I must remember, there's, there's people who have better, much better memories than I do. I'm sure you do. But if I can't, I hear somebody play a song, I can't remember the whole song, I'll remember a, a, a riff. Mm -hmm. And then that's the creative process right there. Because you still hold that little tie or that little thread of who you were and where you came from and what really means something. When you talk about hybridity, and some people here use the term creolization with a small c, and some people are called creoles, <laughs> but, but, and it's complicated. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, we don't go to that one. <laughs> but we, we, there are Cajuns with names like Sheck Snyder exactly. and McGee yeah. and uh, many other names, some Acadian, some continental French. Uh, I just wondered if you could transition us to uh, what happens for you when you go public as a musician, uh, both in the world of you know rock, Cajun rock music, Koto, but also Beausoleil, which is the band you're best known for and over many, many years now. Uh, talk a little about coming out into the public with Cajun music framing tradition, but also creative. New Nick, works. I had no agenda, Nick, except for take over the world. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for me, where I grew up in a French society and the people that I knew, they were my heroes. So I felt very secure in that. And so when we were asked to play other play, it didn't change. There is no act. You know, and that, that came later, <laughs> after the movies and everything, when people, because people from New Orleans, when we first started playing here, one of the first groups to, Acadian groups to play here, Acadian groups, they called us the heathens from the bayous, <laughs> which I loved, actually, you know, I kind of like, <laughs> but the fact that it was, it, but nobody knew, it was just the tip of the iceberg, even Acadians didn't know, there were no notes on albums, there were no notes where people, you knew the people of the family where these songs came from, and the, the creativity was amazing. One of the best, of course, was Ken Rifatno, uh, who took all kind of Creole different fiddle. different Creole fiddle a player. Heritage Award recipient. And it's like, uh, it's, it's like, this is what I want my world to be. Yeah. So when they ask me to play wherever they play, that's what they get, Right. unfortunately. Well, I mean, in, <laughs> generationally, uh, we're, we're from a similar generation uh, in, in that you know, new, new arrangements were being made in the social order, uh, Vietnam protests, uh, emergence of, of much more public discourse of women's rights, uh, civil rights of all kinds. Um, so Cajuns who are thought of as kind of conservative backwoods farm people who made their music am among their families, suddenly you're in a rock band called Koto, where you had twin electric lead guitars, you were playing fiddle, 
You had an accordion yeah, player yeah. A, a dr who could play everything, yeah. a drummer, uh, and, and that band occupied much time of people in their teens and 20s and early 30s for a while around here compared to the Allman Brothers and the Grateful Dead. But it also sort of exploded. <laughs> um, imploded. Yeah, imploded, yeah, yeah. exploded. Yeah. It, it didn't continue. Yeah. But uh, it did in a certain way because the first thing you, you, you missed was Gary, C, Gary Newman. Oh, right, yeah. It was Jimmy C. Newman's son. son. Yeah. Okay. I would say... You're, Famous uh, Cajun country western singer. In Nashville, Nashville. But Gary did not want to be in his father's shadow. Mm -hmm. He wanted to create his own group. That's why he came down to Louisiana to do it. And uh, he found a ragged group to do it. Right. And Gary and I... He came back home, basically. He came back home, because he, and he was born here. Right. So I think that's, that kind of adds to that. And it was his idea to do it. And we had a great time, I think, you know, but that was it, yeah. you know, like you said. Well, what I'm saying, though, is that in the Cajun society, which really was an agrarian society with all of its strictures, yeah. you guys were saying, okay, you know, we're 70s people now. <laughs> we're going to do this. We're coming out. Yeah, no, and, and there, was, there, was that, there was that sense. But at the same time, you were able from there to go on and become a globally known traditionalist making, creating a lot of new music, yeah. but within a sense of Cajun tradition. Yeah, so where it came from. And that's the point, because we all, I play it for music now. Like, I love traditional music, and every, but every time you play a song, it's different. I'm sure it's the same thing with you. You call it jazz, it's improvisational <laughs> music. It's just what you feel at the moment. You have to be true to that moment where you're at. You know, there are people who are great technicians who can play the same thing every time and it's perfect, and people who are not great technicians, but the heart of the matter is right there. So the, I think what we, the goal is to meld the two, your heart and your technique, then you can create something higher. Mm -hmm. So uh, could we ask you to uh, give us a little uh, musical personality well, here? A little personality, I guess. I talked about Dennis McGee, uh -huh. and so this is a song I learned from him in my way. And um, it's one of the, a few songs, the minor key songs, and uh, I've never heard anybody play it, except for him, actually. So it's called, it's a story, it's called Pas Janvier. Pas Janvier is the daddy. Father Janvier, please give me your daughter. And uh, of course he doesn't because he's a musician. <laughs> anyway, I won't get into that. Um. <laughs> Jean Vier. Jean Vier. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, uh, among the many magical aspects of that tune, it was a waltz, yeah. and uh, the two key dances in the French dance halls are waltzes and two steps. There's occasionally some blues and other things mixed in. But you, you played an awful lot of nightclubs <laughs> in southwest Louisiana, you know, and Boo Boo's was one of the best known, but so many others over the years. Bucket of blood, don't forget that. Yeah. So, so what did you learn playing in dance halls? 
and church dances and all the other events where you play. <laughs> where did I learn from that? Is that there's always another song. <laughs> the thing about it, 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 that's how we honed it. We didn't really practice. I mean, we're not, we, I, we never set out to be, I hate to say this, I never set out, set out to be a musician. I, my father said, get a job. It was dying, when he was dying of pancreatic cancer. When are you going to get a job? Well, dad, I finally have a job. But the thing is, is you, you just want to do this. You have to do this. There's, there's no way that you cannot do it once you get caught. And caught up in this thing in reality of, of you find something that is real. Mm -hmm. We should also mention that there's a tremendous scene of Afro-French people out in the rural yeah. area. And the music, most people call it zydeco, snap beans, zydeco et pas salé, meaning snap beans with no salt. We think referring to hard times. Somebody say, comment ça fait? Oh, tu vas faire zydeco, how are you doing? You're going to get your beans in? Well, mais les zydeco sont pas salé. I'll have beans, but no salt, no salt meat. And sort of, it's kind of a blues type statement. There are some other thoughts that maybe there are some uh, West African language relationships, the Munzare, Adzare, which are I party, I dance. And it might have been a pun at some point where people who are bilingual, say with Mande or another language and, and French, we, do, we don't really know, no one tells that tale. But, but the, the Zydeco music, which is driven by a frottois and very complicated uh, rhythm backing, um, is, you know, Cajun music has a triangle occasionally, but the frottois is essential with the accordion in Zydeco, and Zydeco has been influential on Cajun. I thought we should say that. Oh, yeah. Definitely. That's kind of where the Afro and the French come together out in the countryside. That's what I said. Was I was trying to find yeah. the blues. Where does right. the blues come in the music? Right. You know, it's a natural thing. Right. But where does it come from? So we were surrounded by great musicians who are yeah. African or Creoles or whatever. But it was like one family. It was like no difference. You shared the same song, but you played it differently. Played it differently, yeah. Well, and but by by going there and with people like Barry Ancelet and others out doing field work, you, you showed in a way to your parents and grandparents' generation that you were going to admire the elders yeah. who happen to be the musicians, who in another time might have been seen as entertainers, but maybe a little marginal, yeah. ne necessarily going on to becoming a famous farmer or you know, accountant or whatever. <laughs> I don't know if there was, you know, the agenda was, was survival, but when, when you were talking about being here since 1763 in Louisiana, um, as a people, how we got there, because both, both sides of my family were actually sent back to France and got Spanish land grants to come back to Louisiana. I think it was a certain learning process, intelligentsia from that generation that told us the, the facts of life, how to live. Mm. And part of that was music. Right. I think music was always part of this, the fabric because that's the soul. And I think any kind of spiritual in a situation we'll have music and I think that we were very lucky to have so many musicians around. I don't know if, when I grew up and we, I didn't you know I grew up speaking French and English but it was neighbor I don't think I knew a neighbor who didn't play an instrument right that you could just go and jam <laughs> didn't matter what kind of music I mean you know, Bobby Charles wrote for Fats Domino I mean, he was true. our hero he, in his pink Cadillac in yeah Abbeville, you know what I mean? Bo Bobby Charles Gidry. Gidry. Yeah, yeah, it was a case. Yeah, but he went as Bobby Trump. I, I want to come back to you because you've been, been out on a frontier involving a, a, a friend, a colleague, a scientist uh, who loves Charlie Parker too. But tell us about the uh, quantum physics and science approach. Uh, he is also a musician that you've been taking uh, with him, I think, well, now really intensively, but you've known him, I guess, what, 10, 12 years. Yeah, I started looking at. Uh music through the prism of quantum theory and quantum mechanics in, uh, in like 2007 and did a recording called Quantum Leap that dealt with four dimensional time and uh, also the macro level, uh, atomic level. And then I, I met a, I, I sought him out first, a quantum physicist who was also working in that way with music and we connected and we've been dealing with it might the, be him on the phone <laughs> yeah, yeah that's who he played with last night in kansas city yeah <laughs> his, his name is stefan harris I'm, I'm sorry stefan alexander and he if you look him up you'll find that he's been working and 
finding new uh, things about how the universe works and for a long time, very important. But we uh, started collaborating on that. And interestingly, it was quantum physics that got me to understand why all music is the same. Something that some of the older musicians would tell me, and I was like, no, but it's not the same. It, it, that doesn't sound like this. But anyway, I was uh, studying about Planck and the idea of multiverses that came out of, out of his work. And one of the thoughts was, uh, one of the theories says, if there are multiverses, all of them contain the same uh, particles, same waves, they're just put together different. And that's when I had a eureka moment about human beings and, uh, and, and music and everything that we do. Is, and that, we'll just deal with the music, is that we're all using the same thing. We're using rhythm, melody, and uh, all the same components. When you play your violin and I play my saxophone, we're both using the same thing. But we're just using it our words. So that's when I came up with another idea about multiverse music. But, but I realized that all this talk is cute. <laughs> <laughs> but when you take, this, take those notes, we all have the feeling, everything, whatever our feelings are, that we're all doing the same thing. Mm. We're, all, we're, all, we're all using the same thing. If you, if you take that violin and bring it to China, they're gonna play this, they're gonna have the same notes that you have, same instrument, they're gonna do it their way. Well, but of course there are some interesting differences in that I, I went on a tour to China with a Cajun band, uh, Jesse Leger and Savoy, and, and uh, we were at the uh, music conservatory in Guangzhou and an esteemed professor where the idea there is to take local tradition and make, classicize it, said how many hours a day do you practice? And he said, oh, oh, we don't practice, we just play. And, and, and on that note, I was going to ask you to come back and create the multiverse here. We've got something, I think, that we can share together. Yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. Do we have a name for this? Not yet, because it could, I don't know if it's in the public domain, right? <laughs> so we make it our own. Don't say anything yet. Graceful. <laughs> Thank Donald Harrison here on saxophone and chin music. And Michael Ducey also on chin music. And the conversation. And thank you to the thank NA you. for having us. Thank you so much, Nick, Donald, and Michael. Any questions or comments from the council? Is this wow. <laughs> first of all, wow. Is this the first time you've shared the stage? Yeah. <laughs> well, in, in this form. In this, you've been in a band together? No, we have other forms. 
<laughs> Donald and I, are, he's good in the quantum physics. Yeah, I said, yeah, well, I've been there before. <laughs> no, it's the first time. Yeah. But it's like, I mean, I, Donald's like a cousin. A smart cousin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I didn't want to end without... Uh, acknowledging that today is uh, Donald Harrison's birthday. Oh, that's right, yeah. <laughs> so wishing you many, many, many more years of health and joy. Uh, and thank you for, for all you do. And thank you, all three of you. All right. Well, thanks for having us. Thank you. Good to see you all. And as the final uh, piece of business, I'm pleased to announce that the National Council on the Arts has reviewed the applications presented to them and that a tally of the council members' ballots revealed that all recommendations for funding and rejection have passed. So thank you to the council, our speakers, our guests here in Louisiana and online, the staff of the National Endowment for the Arts, Again, thank you to the staff of the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts for hosting us and the staff of all of the organizations that we visited over the last couple of days. Uh, again, thank you to Joycelyn, Monique, Nick, Donald, and Michael for sharing their work with us today. It was inspiring. And with that, the 210th meeting of the National Council on the Arts is now adjourned.